Hey, Father Sam. So, we're uh, about to interview Father Burke Masters, and I wanted to open with my own athlete athletic feat. Okay, you. I want to tell you this story. You have an athletic feat. Yeah. So, okay. picture picture me. I'm picturing it. Uh, I was on the green team. This sounds like a field day story. <laughs> I was on the green team. Okay. Uh, and it was, it was basketball. And the, the clock is counting down. And we're down by two because we didn't count three-pointers yet. And I'm coming down the court, and I'm dribbling. And the clock is going down. Five, four, three, two. And I throw it up with my eyes closed. And swish. Nice. Tie game. Go on. Losing overtime. <laughs> almost. Almost sent my CYO basketball fifth grade team I'm, to the championship game. I'm real glad to know that, that you're able to, to tell that story of a loss. <laughs> like Humility. Yeah, sent it into <laughs> overtime. And we lost in overtime. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> I have this distinct memory of a friend of mine playing for our, our school team and kind of a key moment he gets the ball and he looks down and he realizes where his feet are so he just puts down one dribble and takes a step back so he's behind the three point line stops and puts up this shot the kid who is guarding him just fell asleep let him get behind the three point line he puts up this shot swish same kind of thing except that we won the game but I, I remember watching this happen, and I remember the, like the look on his face as he as he looked down at the floor, stepped behind the line, mm. and took the shot with like all the confidence in the world. Yeah, knew he was going to make that shot. I thought it was great. But it's yeah, funny that's that we're like talking the opposite of what I was feeling. Yeah, but why are we talking about basketball? <laughs> I just thought it was funny that my my father Burke Masters moment came when I was ten in Catholic youth organization basketball, yeah. and I belonged to a team that was a color, not a name. <laughs> that's no that's that's very true yeah i, I appreciate that yeah. uh i don't actually have any stories of um athletic heroics okay uh never never was a great athlete love sports yeah have have played various sports my my whole life but have never had any kind of real success in any of them yeah and i kind of love that actually uh like i know enough about sports that yeah. i can have intelligent conversations with people who are very passionate about them and uh i can i can do just enough that i don't look like a, a complete fool but I'm just bad enough that people go, oh yeah, he's not going anywhere. Nice. Like, there's no future for him in this. Yeah, it's and a comfortable spot. It's very comfortable. Like, yeah. but it took me a long time to get to that comfortable spot. Yeah, sure. And as a, as a kid, I was like, no, yeah, I got to be. Yeah, you're striving for greatness. Yeah, yeah. And and who's who's always the the most popular kid? It's the, the kid who's really good at sports. Who who was not who was the, the most, most popular, popular kid, kid in elementary school? Not me. Whoever's fastest. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was decidedly not fastest. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't tallest. I wasn't strongest. I wasn't best at any any of the sports or anything. But you know what? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I mean, now, now, what an encouraging intro to this. This is <laughs> it's, it's one of those things you realize. You know what? Life's not all about that. But today we got to interview Father Burke Masters, who actually was a phenomenal yeah, athlete, unlike us. Yeah, unlike <laughs> us, exactly. Did some amazing things athletically and in the greatest sport of all time, baseball. Yeah, the greatest sport ever created by by man is baseball and if you disagree with me about that then you're wrong but this is a really important point for us to make and yes. that baseball is it's a great it's a great game yeah. um <laughs> yeah yeah the most catholic game it is the most catholic game yes and for for many reasons um i think we'll, we'll i'll send you an article that you can put in the show notes Beautiful. for this yeah oh, fantastic but I'm, I'm really excited to interview father burke about his book a grand slam for god a journey from baseball star to catholic priest um that's going to be a pretty, a pretty sweet book, and uh, Father Burke seems like a pretty cool guy. Any final thoughts on um, on baseball and uh, why it's better than your favorite sport, which is hockey? Uh, you don't have to skate on knives. <laughs> that is a good reason yeah. to prefer baseball to hockey. Although, I will say Skating this: on knives is pretty cool. <laughs> well, okay, there's the fact that you have knives strapped to your feet that you get to skate on. That is cool, but I. And, and this is weird because I don't think I would last more than three seconds in, in a hockey fight. Sure. Uh, but I've always thought the fact that fighting is a part of hockey was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. That I mean, might, that I, might the, scandalize people, and I apologize. It's it's not no, intended for that. that but, you know. I think that the reason hockey might have a step up on other games is because it 
It's the only sport where you have players that like puncture ribs and then play for three weeks. I'm yeah. sorry, puncture lungs with their broken ribs and then play for three weeks. Yeah, yeah. And that actually happened in the NHL like within this decade. It was the playoffs. He yeah. played for three weeks. Just, Patrice Bergeron. Which seems real dangerous, right? <laughs> it is a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, huh? enjoy this episode. I sure will. I'm going to go this time. All right, fair enough. Yeah, because you went last time. <laughs> Welcome to The Tangent, everyone. I'm Father Sam Kachuba. My name is Matt Sparazza. And today we are joined by Father Burke Masters, a priest of the Diocese of Joliet, the author of A Grand Slam for God, A Journey from Baseball Star to Catholic Priest. Uh, this is published by Word on Fire, isn't it? It Father? is. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a blessing to have studied under Bishop Barron at Mundelein and to you know have their publishing arm with this book because, as you probably know, he has about a million followers. Uh, and so... <laughs> Yeah, people know who he they've, is. They've heard of him, I think, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had the blessing, I say, of studying under him, and I took every class I could, even if I didn't need the class, because it was just such a gift to soak in his wisdom and his style of teaching and preaching always inspired me. Yeah, wow. Well, thanks for, for making the time for us today to, to be with us on the tangent. Um, before we get into you getting into the seminary and having the chance to study under then Father Barron, um, just maybe give us the uh, the elevator pitch for the book. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Grand Slam for God, the seeds of the book started about 10 years ago. And uh, my goal was every time I would share my story from being a Protestant baseball player to a Catholic priest every time somebody would come up to me and say that needs to be a book that needs to that word needs to get out and basically that my story is a story of trying to listen to the voice of god in my heart even when it wasn't something that i wanted or desired but i have found that following god's will is going to lead to the true fulfillment in life true joy true peace uh, even when there's bumps along the road. So I think the book can be for anyone who, you know, is discerning how God is calling them in life or wants to grow closer to the Lord and uh, doesn't know how or is feeling a call to do something that may be outside their comfort zone and uh, uh, give them the courage to take that leap of faith. Hmm. Yeah, nice. Something that I noticed with this is that you're you're filling in a lot of other pieces. So in other words, this, this isn't just about the, uh, it's not just the story of, of how you went from being a Protestant baseball player to a Catholic priest. It's not just a whole bunch of sports memories. And then I decided to become a priest and now I'm doing all of this. It's like, there's a, there's a lot more. And, and this is something I was just telling Matt before we started that uh, I would imagine. So I, I went to seminary right out of high school. Uh, and so I don't have like a whole a whole lot of stories or anything. But when when I was in seminary, I was with guys like one guy who was a Division One quarterback. Uh, you have these other priests; they all had something that was kind of like their their thing. But it was also really easy sometimes to just slap the label on them, like, "Oh, this was the guy who was the college athlete," and so that's the category that he's going to be mm-hmm. in forever. Um, and while this one has a tremendous amount to do with your your athletic career and everything there's something way more important that's Mm -hmm. happening, which is that you're filling out the full picture of of what God's doing in your heart and in your life. And yes, baseball is an incredibly important piece of that, but that's not the whole story. You are not just the baseball priest. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And that's what, uh, you know, I'm a pastor now of a parish here in Hinsdale, Illinois, and People who have read the book now are saying, wow, I didn't know all of that about you. I didn't know that you struggled. I didn't know, you know, that you've lost both of your parents. Um, I didn't know that you had doubts and fears. And and so they said they've appreciated the vulnerability in there. Um, and even people who don't like baseball or like sports, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, I think there's something in there just on the spiritual journey that we're all on that, you know, anybody can get something out of this book, I think, because it's God's story. It's got, this is, even when I wrote the book, I thought it almost sounds unreal. Like it, 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 it can't be all true, but it, but it's my story. And I realized (laughs) that everybody has a story and God is working in everybody's lives. And 
when I hear someone's story, I can always relate to some part of their story. And I think that's the beauty of how Jesus taught through parables and stories is that we can all take something out yeah. of it. You know, on that note that everyone has a story, I think a lot of people go through life actually kind of convinced that they don't have a story that, or, or whatever their story is, it's not worth telling. Mm. And obviously there's details of my story that it's not worth telling. Nobody right. cares. Right. right. <laughs> that, that's not going to help anybody. That's not going to do anything for them. But when we realize that there is in fact a story that can be the way that we witness to God's grace present and active in, in our life. You've had the chance now to do it in book form, but of course it's not just, you don't just write the book and that's the end of your witness. You're, you're doing this every yeah. day. Yeah. And it, it is, it is important for all of us to realize that the Holy spirit is alive and well and is working in each one of our lives. And, you know, people say, well, what's next? And, you know, cause I'm just 56 years old and, Normally, people write their spiritual memoirs when they're much older. So I can't wait to see what happens next. And I think that should be the way all of us approach life to say, okay, Lord, this is where I'm at now. What is next? How, how are you going to continue to unfold your mysteries in and through me? I remember it might have been Bishop Barron who said, God wants to live his mysteries in and through you. And that really struck me like, wow, that, and it's so true that God is working, working out his life and mystery through each one of us. Mm. So as, as you, um, you came to the faith, you came to the Catholic faith, um, as a star baseball player, I don't want to give away the whole book. So I've, I've got to be careful, like what, what I tell people here as we're talking, cause I want people to read this whole book. Cause it's, 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 it's a worthwhile read. Don't you think? Certainly, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, we got to avoid spoilers. If, if you if you hear me veering in that territory, I want you to punch me in the arm. We can mention the Grand Slam. It's in the title. <laughs> okay. But before we get to the Grand Slam, okay. right? There's other stuff, right? Okay. So you grew up in a in a Protestant household, but then you have an opportunity to go to Catholic high school. Let's just talk a little bit about the influence of going to a Catholic school, uh, not only on your baseball career but on most importantly on your, on your spiritual journey. Yeah. I, I, I often think about that. If my parents had not sent me to a Catholic high school, what would have happened? You know? So yeah, I have two older brothers. Uh, they both went to public schools all the way through high school. And my parents weren't happy with everything that was happening in the public schools. And the, the two Catholic high schools in town had the best baseball programs. And so that was kind of the impetus for them to say, you have you have options here, but the two options are the two Catholic high schools, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I thank God for that. Now, at the time, it was quite quite shocking, um, but I, again, seeing how God works in our lives, I see God working through my parents, giving me these options, and then going to this Catholic high school, and yes, having a, a great experience with baseball. But more importantly, encountering the person of Jesus Christ and seeing people living out their faith in an authentic way that was different than I'd experienced before. You know, I, my both of my grandmothers were the church ladies in their respective churches. They both, they literally <laughs> both played the organ at their churches, and uh, so I, I was, I was surrounded by people of faith. But this was just a new experience in the Catholic context that was striking for me and very inviting. Beautiful. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I'm thinking back on my own high school experience. So the, the background you don't know is that Father Sam was my chaplain <laughs> in high school. Wow. Um, and so I'm thinking back to, well, because I, while I didn't necessarily meet Christ in the classroom and father Sam didn't teach me. So that's not a dig. Um, <laughs> I cert, I certainly met Christ through your ministry as a chaplain, but then even more so because we stayed in touch after I graduated. <laughs> I always laugh because part of that story is that you went to college and immediately stopped practicing your faith. Well, you know, I, well, so so I, like I, I, I had was, a great influence I on you. Skipped mass once though. Oh, okay. So it was like, it was, it was just very, it was an aesthetic, I suppose. Right. It was, it was very aesthetic. service level. <laughs> Um, but nonetheless, the fact that I was able to call you up and say, father, like, 
yeah <laughs> what's going on any of this. yeah i'm having a hard time you, your response was well that's not good <laughs> but that's true but the idea of meeting christ in that particular situation like because i've i've often ratted on my high school experience my catholic high school experience um but the seed yeah. was there and i'm so grateful you know uh, as a pastor now with a, a large elementary school here um, with some non-catholic students I always encourage the teachers, don't water down the faith. Um, I think sometimes we, we want to go to the lowest common denominator just so we don't offend anybody. And I was so grateful that they told us going in, you're going to have to go to the all school masses. You have to take the theology courses. Nobody's going to proselytize, but you're going to be presented with the, the faith as it is. And, and I'm so grateful for that because... As, as you know, the truth is attractive. And when the truth is presented in a way that is authentic, um, our hearts, it resonates in our hearts. And it did for me. Um, I will say at the same time that after I became Catholic my senior year in high school, then I went to Mississippi for college baseball. And I was confronted with, again, a com- almost a completely protestant uh context Mm -hmm. and there i did i saw some people again living out their faith in a very authentic way and so i had to come to terms with did i become catholic because it was maybe the only formal context i had of faith um and let's learn more about all of the faiths out there to make sure i made i made the decision that was right for me and ironically being put into a very Protestant context in Mississippi made me question my faith and made actually made my faith stronger because I had to find out the answers. Is this true? Why do I believe this? Uh, and the Eucharist was at the center of everything that kept bringing me back, keeping me in the church and well, I mean, bringing me into the church and keeping me there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also have the, this great community uh, that you, that you speak about um, your Godfather uh, being a coach at the school. And so the influence of teachers, of course, the the sacramental life of the church, but then this this broader community of just people who, who were able to witness to you, but who were, were also able to enter every other aspect of your life. They were able to be with you on the field. They were able to be with you in, in your college decisions. They were able to, to just kind of walk with you and all of this to kind of fill out the picture of what does it mean to be, to be a Catholic or a, a Christian, you know, full stop. That we're not alone. We're we're part of something something much bigger. And you really speak beautifully about that. Yeah, it's so true. And uh, unfortunately, today, because of cultural changes, you know, teachers, we would go over to our teachers' homes and have dinner and play games, and it was such a, a beautiful environment. There might be three or four of us go over for dinner and a, a game of spoons. <laughs> um, But what I saw, and then I would go to mass with them on the weekend. And it was this, again, seeing the Catholic life lived out fully. We'd watch a ball game and and talk about it. So it it really helped me to see, okay, the same person that I see in the classroom, uh, on the baseball field, and married with a couple children, it's, it's all part of this full Catholic identity. And I, and I was drawn to that. And at the time, I really thought this is the kind of marriage and family that I want to have. Uh, and of course, God had other, other plans there. But it, it, was a, it was a beautiful, I want to say my, my public school teachers cared about us, and I believe that. But adding the element of faith just brought it to a whole new level for me that was, was new and very inviting. Beautiful. All right, let's talk about the Grand Slam. So I, think, I, I think it's important. That's why people are tuning in. Uh, tell, tell us the story. You, you finished Catholic high school. You've become a Catholic, and you go off to Mississippi uh, to, to play college baseball. Take it away. Yeah, and so it wasn't always uh, Grand Slam. You know, I, I redshirted my first year, uh, meaning I could practice but not play, but I still had four years of eligibility. and uh, But then f- started for four years, had a good college career, I set, you know, the the school and conference records for hits in a career. So it wasn't like I was like, wow. you know, 
uh, just a part-time player. And my senior year, so ironically, this fifth year never would have happened had I played my freshman year. So again, God's providence, going through the suffering of redshirting, and I wanted to transfer. I came home at, after my uh you know, Thanksgiving break my freshman year, and I said, I'm not going back because I just found out I was going to redshirt. And thank God my my dad said, you're staying there. Um, <laughs> and because he knew I was making an emotional decision and was thinking very short term. And so uh, I get to my fifth year um, and in the regional tournament to go to the College World Series, I got into the proverbial zone and everything slowed down, was going perfectly. And in, in one game against Florida State in the winner's bracket game, you know, I was six for six, hit a grand slam in the ninth inning. It was not a walk-off grand slam. It, it's funny how the story can kind of grow like a fish story can. <laughs> Some people say, oh, I heard you hit a grand slam to win the College World Series. <laughs> so the Grand Slam was in the top of the ninth inning. Even though we were at home, we were the visiting team in that game. So it did put us ahead in the ninth inning, and then we had to hold them in the bottom of the ninth. But I remember when I when I got up to bat for the Grand Slam, I was already five for five, bases loaded. We were down by a run. And, you know, if I hit into a double play, the game was over, and maybe the season would be over. Um, and I worked the count to three and one, and my first thought was, take a pitch. If he walks you, the game's tied. And my coach gave me, he, he did this sign. Uh, I'm making kind of a small square sign with my hands. Like if the ball's in one area, swing at it. And uh, and so, boy, he, he threw probably a 93-mile-an-hour fastball right down the middle. He had to throw a strike. And I swung. And it was one of those where when I hit it, I didn't even feel it. You know, when you when you hit something purely, it just it just jumps off the bat. And it was one of the few times in my life when as soon as I hit it, I knew that it was gone. Most of my home runs would just barely go over the fence. I wasn't I wasn't known as a power hitter, maybe five home runs a year. And uh, the the place just went crazy. Uh, there were probably, I don't know, 12 or 13,000 people at, at the game. I was floating around the bases. I come around third base and my teammates are going crazy at home plate. It was deafening the noise in the stadium and just something I, I will never forget. And uh, that helped propel us into the College World Series. Um, I, ironically, I say it, it was voted the number one sports moment in Mississippi State history. Uh, the irony is that I wasn't a home run hitter. <laughs> And I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But looking back on it now, I see that it was God gave me that moment because the major leagues was not in his plans. Uh, he gave me that moment mm -hmm. to enjoy uh, and to look back on with maybe to write a book about my life. Uh, and mm -hmm. and now to bring it, you know, fast forward into into a life of faith and priesthood. Uh, the detail that you remember the whole thing with is really mm -hmm. powerful. So it's a three, one pitch. It was a 93 mile an hour fastball because he had to throw a strike. Uh, the, it's a, it's a typical athlete kind mm -hmm. of a memory, right? That you, you remember all the details of the, the situation in the game. Um, and, and exactly like what kind of pitch was like, I knew you were going to know mm -hmm. what kind of pitch it was. And if you didn't say it, I was going to ask you, I, I love that, that aspect of it. But do you see those kinds of details emerging in other areas of, of your life, other, other moments uh, where like the details are as, as tangible to you now as they were the moment that it happened? Yeah. Those key moments in life that are markers in our lives, they, they get seared into our memories, good and bad, you know? Um, I talk about the death of my mother in the book, and those details are the same in the same sense of clarity, uh, and um, but also those beautiful moments of the Grand Slam, the day of my ordination. You know, I remember the things so clearly, and you know, first day coming here to the parish, those kind of markers in our lives. Um, I'm sure everybody listening can remember some of those, like. You know, people will say, I knew where I was when JFK was shot. I knew where I was when the Twin Towers fell. 
and funny when I go back to Mississippi, uh, it's almost like uh, people will remember exactly where they were when I hit the grand slam. <laughs> and it, I always joke with my family, if, if everybody who tells me they were there were there, there would have been a hundred thousand people at the game. <laughs> and about six different people have told me that they got the home run ball. Uh, so yeah, I love it's, that. Uh, That's awesome. When I read that in the book, yeah, I it was that funny. Lot. Has anyone actually tried to give you the ball? <laughs> exactly. So, like, and, and claim exactly. this was the one. Sign this one. This is the grand slam. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's so it is. Funny. Now, you're talking about you know having those memories, and in your book you talk about inviting Christ in your imagination in moments to heal. Um, and Doctor Bob Schutz is one of the individuals who I don't know if he was on the back cover, but he's he's one of the individuals who. Uh, Gonna consult the back yeah, cover here for a yeah. second. It was on the. He's not there. He's not on the back. No, on, I thought he was. There's no, some blur. Wrong. There's some blurbs <laughs> inside the book, and he he's one of the ones that wrote okay, the blur, blurbs. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um. And and his ministry obviously is a healing ministry. The JP two Center for Healing is that what it's called? Yes. Um. And. But but a lot of it is imaginative healing. So I was wondering if you would just kind of lead us through that process, you know, I guess briefly, cause we don't have that much time, yeah. but, but yeah, yeah. it, uh, Dr. Bob has become a very good friend and an important uh, person in my life as I've gone through healing. And in fact, I just got off of a, a healing retreat that we do for bishops. One of their taglines is healing at the center of, at the heart of the church and what better place is there with our, with our leaders. But basically, uh, inner healing prayer is going back to moments in our lives where we've experienced pain, where we've been wounded. And what the enemy does is around wounds, the enemy sells us identity lies. Like uh, you're not a beloved child of God, that God abandoned you, that you're no good, that you're dirty, whatever lies that he can sell us. And then we start to uh, make make vows around these lies. Like I will never love somebody again because that hurt too much. And so what he invites us to do is to go back into those memories and invite Jesus, not necessarily invite, Jesus was already there. He asked Jesus, show me where you were in this situation. And for example, around my mother's death, I won't go into details, the the lie that I believed when my mom died was that God had abandoned us in our most important time. And then I started to believe that I can't trust God anymore. And I was in the seminary. Fortunately, a spiritual director helped me to go back into that moment and say, Lord, where were you? And the Lord showed me that he was right there with us in the depth of our, our pain and suffering. And almost immediately, the dis the lie was dispelled that God had abandoned us. And I knew instinctively that even though somebody can say, this is just my imagination, the fruits were there. And I started to experience healing and peace in an area that was had been full of, of pain, anxiety, fear. All of those things started to dissipate. So it's a beautiful, if you've never been exposed to the uh, JP2 Healing Center, books and retreats uh they're very powerful you'd love them i've i've read be restored yeah, yeah. um and admittedly it took me like right. two years yeah, yeah so long to get through <laughs> yeah. this book we'll get you on one of the retreats it's, um, it's something else yeah father sam you've been on a retreat or have you experienced it yeah yeah, I did their their retreat for priests a couple years ago nice um, and just an incredible experience just to 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 recognize some of those places where there there were those inner vows that I wasn't even aware of. There were things that I was holding on to that I, I it, it was so at the level of the subconscious that I didn't even realize that I was I was holding on to resentment or anger about mm -hmm. certain things. And they just got right to the heart of it. I remember sitting with with my director during that that retreat and she she just threw this one question at me and it I was a mess the rest of the day, <laughs> like in the best yeah. possible way. And it was, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so good when you realize that. And actually that was one of the things I was grateful to read in, in, in the book, as painful as it is to tell that story of, of your mother's passing, um, the way that you share it 
the way in this book that you're able to to speak about those those places of grief, of of pain, um, the challenges that you've had. Um, yeah, it was it was really important. Just like I, I was saying before that 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 label of like the the baseball priest could easily get get applied. I think a lot of times people hear the the story, they get the the bare bones sketch. He was a Protestant. He became a Catholic. He was a baseball player. He was a hero in the College World Series. Now he's a priest. Isn't that great? And they just kind of focus. It's the highlight reel, and you're telling everything else in between mm-hmm. the highlight reel. <laughs> you know, like you're you're not afraid of those of those places, and that's such an important thing. I'm thinking about myself uh, as a high school student getting uh, a book called A Priest Forever. I don't know if you ever read A Priest Forever about Father Eugene Hamilton. Yeah. Um, who is a, he was a seminarian for the Archdiocese of New York who was diagnosed with cancer and was ordained on his deathbed um, just a couple hours before he died. And the, the story is really powerful. Um, and it, I so appreciated some of the other stuff that was, was in there. But because it was a story about him and it wasn't him telling the story, that there are things that I'm, I'm sure he would have he said about himself mm. that somebody telling the mm. story couldn't tell. But what you're getting into here is... is more than just the highlight real stuff you're you're willing to share the fuller story and how that includes your humanity the challenges that you face and so you you make it really clear to become a priest to to live out the catholic faith it's not always easy but god is present with us along the way and here's how i know because i faced this challenge this challenge this thing this difficulty and along the way, I've learned how God's present there. So I'm, I'm just really grateful reading this, how, how you're able to share that so mm-hmm. so powerfully. Yeah, thank you. I've had uh, several people here in the parish who say, thank you. They, they, they talk about chapter five, and I have to remember, okay, what was chapter five? <laughs> and it's, it is the story about my mom's death. And most people, most adults have, have had to deal with death, you know, and uh, they say, thank you for showing us that fuller picture of of the real depth of your your grief and pain. It wasn't just like a normal death of somebody dying at 102 years old, you know. And so I'm hoping that that opening up my heart because I've gone to, I've gone into those places with the Lord and he's healed me of a lot of things. And so now I have the courage to be able to say, this is, this is a safe place to go. You, you're allowed to go into my into my places of pain, but trusting that God God's going to meet you there as well. You know, I, I have full confidence that God will meet us in our worst places and and help us heal. And as a priest now, that's that's the confidence that I have. You know, for example, we had a um, a tragic accident here in our our parish this past summer, and had I not done the work of going into the depth of my own grief, I would keep somebody else's grief that's that deep, just at arm's length, because it would it would bring me too mm-hmm. close to my own pain. But because I've gone into that with the Lord, I'm much more, I don't want to say comfortable, but uh, much more confident that I can go into that pain with somebody else, that the Lord will meet them there as well. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's why the Lord allows us to go through that pain, right? Because it's the communion of saints, Mm -hmm. and we are a church that is a community. Yeah, and so He, He just uses everything for good. He uses everything good for good, even even that. He never said He would take the suffering away, right? In fact, He says there's going to be some heavy cross. (laughs) Pick up your cross. (laughs) Yeah, but He he promises us that He'll be in it with us, you know, and that's, that's the beautiful promise that he's going to help us carry these crosses. So speaking of heavy crosses and being on the tangent, which we try to live up to our name, um, I'm, I'm a Mets fan, a lifelong Mets fan. And so I've learned heavy a lot about crosses. suffering and uh, carrying heavy crosses. Uh, I, I know it through and through. Uh, it's been, it's been a part of my life for, for a long time. Oh, um, so I'm, you know, grateful for Buck Showalter and everything that he did for the team these last two years and sad to see him go, but I, I get it. It's a business and all this other he's stuff. He's a Mississippi State crowd, um, by the way. Buck Showalter, oh, see? yeah. Man. Okay, so I think he's got a great baseball name, Buck Showalter. You have a great baseball name, Burke Masters, right? 
I could never have gotten away with with being a baseball star, Sam Kachuba. It just doesn't work, right? It just doesn't roll off the tongue as as easily for for like the the baseball name. You got to have a good baseball. Terrible name. for baseball, perfect for podcast. Yeah, exactly. It's it's great, but like, in yeah, there's all right. Baseball, I think, is the most Catholic sport. Not because of who who plays it, but I think that the whole the whole approach to the game is is the more Catholic approach. Uh, do you agree and why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, as a as a hitter in baseball, you know, I think my college average was just over three hundred. You know, that means close to seventy percent of the time I failed. And uh, you know, so learning to deal with defeat to learning to deal with uh, not being successful um, was uh, an important part of the game. But, you know, and, and also, you know, I'm the Cubs chaplain now. Uh, the, I think that might have been part of what you were referring to uh, for, for <laughs> Cub fans after 108 years to finally win a World Series, that, that suffering and ag- agony. Uh, it's almost like the the resurrection happened here in Chicago in 2016. <laughs> yeah. Were you there chaplain was, when they yes. won? Oh, that's so cool. Okay. Yeah. We're going to come back to that then. Cause that's an important yeah. thing to talk about, but continue. But, I, but I think, yeah, there, there's so much, there's so much in baseball that I relate to faith. One of my favorite things to do is to go and talk about faith and, and sports because there, there's so many interrelated things we do a Catholic baseball camp every summer here in our diocese. Um, Usually have Mike Sweeney, uh, former Kansas City Royal, come out, mm-hmm. and uh, we kind of wrap the, our Catholic faith around baseball. And there's just so many great analogies that you can bring into. Um, and I would agree, baseball is the most Catholic sport there is. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I knew was it. telling my I wife knew. all about those camps. <laughs> so my, I'm admittedly, I'm a gigantic okay. hockey fan. Just right. So I'll throw it out there. Nobody's perfect. Um, <laughs> nobody's perfect. <laughs> but I, my, my wife and her family are all huge Pittsburgh mm. Pirates fans. So they, and to which I, I gave up the New York Yankees to become a Pirates fan, and she gave up the Pittsburgh Penguins to become a New York Rangers fan. Uh, so we both gave up winning teams for teams <laughs> that lose all the time. Um, so I have a, I have a smaller cross, but a cross. Um, but I was telling her all about this, this, uh, these baseball camps because I was, I was kind of blown away. And what really stuck out to me was that you specify how people said you shouldn't make it a Catholic baseball camp. You should make it a Christian baseball camp. You'll reach more people. Um, and how that on the surface, I mean, it could be a good yeah. thing, right? Um, but you kind of stuck to your guns and said, no, we're going to keep it a Catholic baseball camp and we're going to teach right the fullness of this faith through this game. Uh, and it's kind of, we, I was talking to her about it because we talk about, we have, we have a one-year-old son. I'm sorry. He's not one. He's four months. I was thinking about something else. He's in his first year. He's in his first year. He's on his way to one. Um, and knowing that sh- her whole family is such a big baseball family, um, we know we're going to put him in baseball. Um, and how we the could- right decision, put- <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I know. It's the most Catholic game. Yeah. Um, and so considering all of these things, we tr- we kind of try and have the conversation of like, well, how far is too far for a game? When does a game become an idol? And this was like, oh my gosh, we can connect these two things. So I know we're talking about the camp, but can you specify some of the things about sure. the camp? Yeah, you should you should come out and uh, see it. So we, we start with mass at eight o'clock and the kids are in their uniforms and their camp shirts and everything. And we have the parents... The parents are welcome to stay the whole day uh, if they'd like. So we start with mass and then uh, and then we go out on the field, warm up. And and then for the rest of the morning, we, we do drill work. So station work, you know, whether they're pitching or hitting or fielding or throwing. And uh, we, we encourage the coaches to bring in pieces of faith whenever they can in that coaching piece. We come in for lunch. We usually have Mike Sweeney, myself, maybe some other uh, professional ball players share our our faith testimony with the kids. And it's so beautiful to see, you know, these kids when they see a Mike Sweeney who made millions of dollars playing baseball talking about Jesus and the Eucharist and things. It's yeah. unbelievable. And then we go out for games in the afternoon. And Mike, 
so this is all the dream of Mike Sweeney. He calls them uh, the, the virtue games. And so, for example, the first inning of the game is normal baseball. Uh, second inning is he calls it the silent second. So nobody can say a word. Uh, and so he says, sometimes we have to curb our tongue. We have to learn how to, you know, not say something uh, when we, our instinct is to say it. If, you, if, you, if they speak in the second inning, they have to do 10 push-ups um, and so on. So I should have played <laughs> that game personally. Every <laughs> inning has a different uh, twist to it, but a, a spiritual uh, piece to it. And then after that, we, we finished the day with uh, talking about Mary, pray a decade of the rosary. And uh, I love how we finish. We have priests uh, on the different positions on the field. Mike gives a big pep talk about confession. And you got kids running out to the uh, priests on the field. They're going to confession. Wow. And then uh, you see them kind of dropping to their knees to do their penance on the baseball field. It's really mm. cool. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Powerful. Yeah. That's great. Now, we've, we've, we've kind of touched on how sports is such a it's like a fount for virtue kind of you know what i mean like it, it helps you it helps you build virtue sure. and i think the obvious ones are like if you play football football it helps you build courage <laughs> because you have to run <laughs> as fast as you possibly can into a seven foot wall um <laughs> but i was sitting here saying you know it's funny when I, I i spend too much time on youtube and if you watch sports highlights on youtube there's like a whole culture of okay i'll do it myself which is so counter to mm. the Catholic faith. And it's so counter to like, well, just everything we believe, I suppose, right? Um, and so how does sports build humility? Now, my guess is by losing. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm curious what your yeah, take is. So, you know, humility, literally from the Latin word humus means of the ground. So you have your feet planted on the ground. And it, it can be challenging if my brothers were always good. You know, they said, our job is to keep you humble. <laughs> you know, he said, if you're reading <laughs> your your headlines or watching the news and you're like in Mississippi, they treated us like professional ball players because there's no, you know, at the Braves and the, the Rangers were like the two closest professional baseball teams. Mm. Um, you know, so we were treated like rock stars. Uh, but failing 70% of the time, but also uh, having faith to realize that my identity doesn't come from being a baseball player. My identity comes from being a child of God. Um, both ways, you know, if I'm doing really good. So mm -hmm. before I knew that, when I when I was six for six with a grand slam, I thought I was, a, I was all that, you know? And then when I was 0 for 4 yeah. and made three errors, <laughs> I thought I was a horrible person. But the truth is, I'm a child of God no matter what happens. And that's what gives us that um, that humility to say, this isn't about me. It's about grounding myself in the love of God and mm -hmm. then, you know, acting out of that identity. Hmm. Does, do you think that, do you, so I'm, I, I struggle with the amount of, sports consumption so i'm not i'm not primarily an athlete i'm primarily a viewer mm -hmm. of sports um that's most of the country yes. yeah Just, no I, I i think it is and, and you and i, I are in good company man <laughs> good, good yeah. company. um how how do you think one should balance watching sports right like the practical approach to the christian life what is too mm -hmm. much sports yeah it's a, it's a great question as somebody who you know i don't play anymore but i i yeah, I love this time of year. We're going into, you know, playoff baseball and, and NFL, oh, yeah. college football. And hockey. hockey. And hockey. Yeah, <laughs> hockey is yeah. also a sport. Yes, very good. Yeah. Um, I always try to ask myself and I'll ask people, if you're spending more time on that than you are uh, with your faith, then things are out of order. We can all make sports an idol. And an idol is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, really worshiping anything that's not God. Um, for example, I, I ran into the, this is a great story. I ran into a family at the grocery store. I was of course dressed like a priest. They all had their Cubs, you know, gear on. Mm -hmm. And we got to a point in the conversation where they said, you know, we're Catholic, but you know, sorry, we, we don't, we don't really go to church much. 
Um, we're going to let our kids decide their faith when they get older. And something inspired me to say, I said, well, you haven't waited to indoctrinate your kids into the Cubs, I see. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it really took them aback. But then we had this great conversation. They realized, yeah, we weren't waiting for them to be adults to become Cub fans. We should not wait until they're adults to become Jesus fans, you know. Um, and yeah. so I, I've started to see them uh, at church, which is a great thing. And so I think it's it's good for all of us to realize, am I putting sports, which can be a great thing for us personally and, and as a society, but am I putting it before God? And I think there's a large number of people that that do. And then it becomes, that's why when you, if, if like there's a lot of, uh, sadness around Chicago because the Cubs didn't make the playoffs. Mm. If if I'm or Notre Dame lost a big game, we have a lot of Notre Dame people here. If if I'm becoming depressed over this, then things are out of order, <laughs> you know. But you know, if yeah. if my team loses, oh well, it was a bad day. But life goes on. I have to remember again who I am and what I'm here for. So I think it's it's good reflection for all of us to to take to prayer. Yeah. So as chaplain for the Cubs, and I think this this kind of comes as a surprise to people to find out that professional franchises have chaplains coming to minister to the needs of their players. Um, you have the chance to celebrate mass for the team um, on on yes. Sundays. Uh, are you able to be with them at other times when you're maybe not saying a mass for them? Not too much. Unfortunately, being a pastor, that's my full-time role. I I wish I could be a full-time chaplain where I could travel with them and get to know their families better. Um, in fact, I, yeah. I'm hoping that we can... So there's an organization called the Catholic Athletes for Christ that are in charge of getting priests into NFL and Major League Baseball teams. Uh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> if the Mets come calling, there I'm, I'm there. 100%. Um, I wish we would have like a focus model of, you know, the college campus model where we, where we had yeah. lay oh, missionaries yeah. where they, or priests, we don't have a lot of priests uh, sitting on the bench, so to speak, looking for something to do, but lay missionaries where they can really get to know these guys uh, on more on a full-time basis. And, I, you know, great ministry happens through relationships. And uh, I'm hoping we can team up with something like focus and the priest chaplains to do a better job. Because what, what happens is we have a lot of guys from, you know, Latin America who are in baseball. They come as young teenagers and uh, a lot of them, unfortunately, are exposed to things that aren't Catholic uh, early on and sometimes anti-Catholic, unfortunately. And by the time they get to the major leagues, a lot of these guys have, have left the faith. And so uh, I'd love to see us do uh, more work in that area with minor league baseball as well. Yeah. Wow. When you're, when you're saying mass for the, for the team, are members of the, of the visiting team often with you as well? Are you like, like the only, forgive the, the pun, but the only game in town when it comes to mass yeah, so, uh, at the stadium? So you do have uh, guys from both teams and uh, what's beautiful is you'll have, it, it's open to employees of the stadium as well. Uh, it's not open to the fans because it's before the gates open and we don't want people going to mass just to get autographs. You know what I mean? Uh, sure. <laughs> but it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I remember during the 2016 run, Miguel Montero hit a, a grand slam to beat the Dodgers in the NLCS. I think on Saturday night, on Sunday, he was there at mass. You have players from the other team. And then you have people who, they're sitting next to them who sell beer at the game, you know, and it really yeah. becomes clear that in God's eyes, we're all the same. God doesn't care how much money we make, what our job title is, if we hit a grand slam or not, but he loves us all as his children. And that becomes so clear at these masses at the ballpark. Mm. Beautiful. Wow. It's really good. Yeah. Um, favorite baseball movie? Uh, Feel the Dreams. Yes, I knew it. Wow, okay. I knew it. Yes. Okay, good. I see. I've got this whole thing field of dreams. All right. I think it's the, the most Catholic, unintentionally Catholic. Oh, let me movie. hear it. All right. <laughs> so, if you build it, he will come. And so that's that that space that we have to construct in our own heart and our own life mm. for God, right? 
um, ease his pain. I mean, what is that but a theology of reparation and the idea of atonement and the idea of offering something to the Lord uh, who suffered and died for us on the cross. So offering to him our, our own pain as a way of accompanying him on the way of the cross and then go the distance. I mean, that's just persevere in the spiritual life until you mm. get to heaven. And it's so powerful and so beautifully done. And in the end, what's it all about? I mean, if you haven't seen Field of Dreams at this point, Mm -hmm. that's your fault, okay? It's been out for a long time. But it brings about reconciliation Mm -hmm. with the Father. Dad, you want to have a catch, right? Like, And there he is now, like, restored. He knows who he really is. And he also knows who his Father really is. Like, he he does that thing at the the end where he's trying to, hey, Mm -hmm. John, you know, but that's not, that's not it. There's... He finally calls him dad. Like so, the the last domino falls, right? And he's able to fully reconcile. And it's, I went to the Field of Dreams mm-hmm. last summer. I had I had a chance to go out there, and it was an emotional experience that I wasn't <laughs> expecting. I think he means the word yeah. mystical. <laughs> no, like like emotional, like standing out on that field, and like I I no joke. I my brother uh, my brother's the athlete in the family. He played. Uh, Division three college baseball for for a few years and everything. So like he's he's always been a great athlete and I've always admired him on on the field and everything. So he's a shortstop, and I, I went to short, and I was just like thinking about him. I said a prayer for him at shortstop, at at the Field of Dreams, which might seem like a weird place to say a prayer for your brother, no. but like I couldn't. It was it was a powerful mm. experience. Yeah. So Field of Dreams, I'm really glad that you said that. I'm really glad that's your I'm favorite. I'm going to have to watch it again. It's the correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've just watched it kind of as, as a pure baseball movie with a great story, but uh, uh, I'll look for those themes now. Well, you gave the right answer, and that's really all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really well done. <laughs> uh, Father, where can people find out more about you? I know you have a, a blog still yeah. um, that's, yeah, that's so, going. And a YouTube channel. And a YouTube yeah, channel. Yeah, so Sweet. I started uh, uh, a blog when I was in seminary. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's been going 20 some years. Uh, so it's at FR Burke, B U R K E 23. That was my baseball number, uh, dot wordpress.com. And then, uh, you can just okay. find me under father Burke masters on YouTube and, uh, and you can find the book. Fortunately, we're on the second printing already. The first printing sold out first couple nice. of weeks. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. So, uh, that should be ready by mid October. Uh, and you can get that at Word on Fire, Amazon, and, and Barnes and & Noble. Awesome. That's great. We'll, we'll put links in the show notes Definitely. for everybody so they can they can see it. Um, Father Burke, thank you so much. This thank is you for great. You're welcome. To great today. to be with you guys, too. And uh, yeah. I guess both the, the Mets and the Cubs, can we can <laughs> lick our wounds over the offseason. <laughs> There's always, always next, next year, year, Father. There's always <laughs> next exactly. year. We have to be men of you hope. You keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, wow, thanks so much. God Bob. bless you both. All right. God bless you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to further support The Tangent, please consider subscribing or following on your preferred platform, following us at the Tangent underscore Catholic on Instagram, or even donating at VeritasCatholic.com. See you next time. God bless.